But that creates a lot of volatility when you have mortgage-backed securities in the financial markets. Rates start going higher. The portfolios has to sell some. And when rates go lower, they have to buy some. And so you get a lot more volatility when rates change. Now, if the Fed owns them, it just doesn't care. If their loan turns out to be longer because rates went higher, they don't care and they don't do anything. So what they do when they buy mortgage-backed securities or when they fund mortgages directly is they take volatility out of the market, which I think serves public purpose, which is why I've proposed all mortgages be funded by the central bank and not by the private sector so we don't have all this crazy volatility every time rates change. You don't need the financial sector for the real stuff that gets financed. It's just all like people digging holes and filling them in. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, And I'm Patricia Pina. And joining us once again today, it's our privilege to welcome back MMT founder Warren Mosler. Hi, Warren. Hello. Good morning here. Good afternoon there. So this week was a good week for stocks, I read. The S&P 500 index went above 4,400 for the first time since April 2022. Yes. Your response to that on Twitter was pretty good tailwind from the 8% plus fiscal deficit. Tell yeah. us what you mean by that. Well, if you look at the government deficit for the last year, it's close to $2 trillion, which is something like 8% of GDP. And not that that's what's going to be going forward, but it's probably not a bad indication. And that doesn't include the net interest the Fed pays on reserve. The, the Fed owns some securities that pay interest, treasury securities. And to pay for those securities, it creates reserve balances. It pays for them by crediting reserve accounts of the seller. And then it pays interest on those accounts. And then for some of those accounts, they allow the holders of the reserve accounts to shift their money to what are called RRP accounts at the Fed that have collateral for technical reasons. Some banks need those things. And they pay interest on those as well. And they're paying the overnight rate on those, which is five and a quarter percent now, I think, which is higher than the interest that, we have to, that they receive on the treasury security. So the Fed is a net payer of interest. And it's accounted for by showing a drop in Fed capital, which is meaningless operationally, but it allows the accountants to make sure they got the have made a mistake. And that is this functions the same as the Treasury paying interest for the economy. People in the economy don't care whether they're getting the money. It all comes from the Fed. Some of it the Fed is debiting the Treasury's account, some it's not. So but it's all the same. So the deficit's actually higher than that. So I'll throw in maybe eight percent plus or something like that to account for that extra. And that extra could be, I don't know, a couple hundred billion a year. It could be a lot. So we have this deficit spending that's not, it's proactive. Unemployment's at a record low. It's not for unemployment compensation because of a crisis or a recession. It's not because of, you know, a collapse in income because of a recession. That, so you'll see the deficit going up counter-cyclically when you get a recession. As transfer payments go up, unemployment insurance goes up, and tax receipts fall because of the recession. This is not that at all. This is all proactive during an expansionary phase. GDP has been positive for the last year. And the deficit spending has been proactive. It's been social security increases, military spending, and probably half of it, 4%, is from interest expense because the Fed has been raising rates. So we got this whopping 8% deficit, which we, I don't know if we've ever seen this in a normal, in a peacetime expansion. You know, coming out of the great recession of 09, of 08, in 09 with the stimulus, I think the deficit might have gotten up to 9% counter-cyclically, but it never got up 
you know, procyclically like this. So this is highly unusual to have deficit spending with unemployment at 50 year lows, you know, deficit spending this height. And so that's driving demand. And, you know, the big question is, well, is any of that interest income being spent? And I mean, I don't know, I don't go interview the people or anything like that, but I can see the GDP numbers and the total spending numbers, and they're all going up as if it was getting spent. So until somebody shows where else that spending is coming from, I don't think there's any harm in assuming that it's a contributing factor. Now, maybe if those were just stimulus checks like we sent out under COVID, more of it would get spent, maybe only 50% is getting spent or 40% or something, but there's enough of it getting spent to drive the economy and it's going up because treasury securities that mature are the older ones that were at lower rates and then the new ones pay higher rates, new treasury bills pay higher rates. And so it's continuously moving up here. And so we'll see that increase to, I don't know, 9% or something before too long. And that's going to continue to drive growth. I mean, I don't think there's any mystery that increased government spending, all else equal, drives growth. Yet every narrative out there says, you know, recession is going to be, you know, 12 months from now. And that's been going on for a year and they keep pushing it off. And it's based on this theory that, or this model assumption that higher rates will cause a recession through some channel with long and indeterminate lags somehow. But it hasn't happened. And there's certainly, if you listen to Chairman Powell's last speech last week, he's, they're definitely questioning their whole, their models because he just said we've been wrong every time. So whenever we present this argument to other economists, just generally, and those who agree with you, they raise a really interesting point. And I think I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it. But it's that obviously the people who hold bonds, either mostly pensioners or people that have already large amounts of savings, right, who are, have bought purchased bonds, and their propensity to consume will be much lower than if the same money was going to the working classes, people who don't have savings. So how much of this kind of feeding into the stock market has to do with people simply having more savings and not knowing where to put them so they just buy stocks with it? And how much of it is genuinely them going out to spend things and creating employment and that feeding into the profitability of these stocks? You know, I, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> why, I, don't, I don't really care. <laughs> like, right. why, why, why does it matter? You know, you, but, but one creates growth <laughs> and the other one doesn't, or am I wrong? I don't know. You can look at the growth in the economy. You know, in the U.S. economy, at least, is growing. And you could say, I don't know, housing, obviously, you know, there's always winners and losers, right? So housing was a loser for a while. But even then, you know, you had housing had an enormous, you know, run up for whatever reason. You could call it a bubble, maybe, but it didn't. But what happened, it went up like 30% in one year, the prices. And then we have this interest rate hikes and mortgage activity drops and everything else. And, and the prices go flat. They go sideways for a while. And now they're going back up again. That's not much of a break. Okay. So that's one of the losers. On the other side, you've got all the winners that you're talking about. And are they spending their money? Well, housing's going back up with and the all cash buyers, if you look at it, have, have been there the whole time. And it continues to go up. And do you get valuation adjustments? Sure. What about earnings for stocks, earnings for banks, earnings for all these corporations? Look at corporate earnings in general. They're they're way up, okay, because you're flooding the economy with dollars, you know, net dollars, net spending, deficit spending. And those dollars go somewhere. So you try and see if, from the data where they're going. So you see corporate earnings going up. You see bank earnings going up. We had a bank crisis that lasted about two or three weeks, mostly a scare, mostly a liquidity crisis. The banks didn't actually like lose any money or anything, and certainly not because the rates wasn't material enough to eliminate their capital. Now, I know the FDIC botched it up when they made the sale. You know, it's a, it's a miracle of making the blind man lame, I used to call it, <laughs> where they take a bank that's worth a lot in one piece, and they break it up into its pieces and when each piece is worth less than the, the whole, which it is, and, and not a lot. It was a few billion dollars. But they had a bank, you know, SVB Bank, two weeks before. Most analysts were recommending buying it because the earnings were good. And they knew that they had bonds that were bought with lower rates, but they also have a lot of deposits that have to stay there at zero rates. And, they, you know, one matched off against the other, you know, until the FDIC broke them up. But, you know, it's, and so, and then First Republic, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with that bank good earnings and everything else. And the problem was 
what we call liquidity. People, because of rumors and everything else and fears, they tried to get $40 billion worth of deposits. There was a $300 billion bank, something like that, about $40 billion in deposits. People had given instructions to the bank to make payments to other banks. They were moving their money to other banks. And the story I heard was SVP put together the collateral. They're allowed to use the commercial loan book. And we're bringing it over to the Fed to use this collateral because it's all got to be documented. It's a lot of paperwork. And they got there like 15 minutes after the close. And so it's too bad it doesn't count and the banks failed. But whatever, it failed because so many people tried to move their money to another bank, not because of they were going to lose it or anything like that. There weren't, and no, nobody lost any money. All depositors were paid, which is after a few days, they realized all, a few weeks, all depositors were getting paid, whether they're insured or not. And there was, they started using some kind of wholesale loan program where they could pull their uninsured loans and somehow get them into $250,000 pieces. So the whole thing would functionally be insured. And some people just stopped worrying about losing their money and the whole crisis went away because it was a crisis of liquidity. It had nothing to do with the economy or banks getting underwater because they were borrowing short and lending long. It had nothing to do with that. And since then, bank stocks have been going up, bank earnings are good, and there are no crises. We had a legitimate potential crisis with the debt ceiling. And personally, I deferred purchases and doing things because if that thing had hit, it would have been catastrophic. Now that's passed us. And so, you know, I've resumed my normal expenditures and I'm sure that's pretty common. That was a, a serious, you know, a risk. And during that whole period of time, the government's deficit spending did slow down. They raised interest rates. They paid out more just that people were holding back while their coffers were continuing to fill. And now it's going to spill out again. It's, we're going to have this burst of spending. When you said you were deferring your spending, what was the worry if the debt ceiling agreement could not be reached, you know, that the banking system would seize up again? Yeah, well, the whole economy could go into a downward spiral because if the government can't spend because of the deficit limits, that means people aren't getting the money, they don't have the income, which means they're not paying taxes. And so that means the government has to spend less. And if they spend less, then there's less tax being paid because most of our taxes are transactions-based. So you get a downward spiral that nobody in the media was talking about, which particularly concerned me. <laughs> it's like nuclear weapons. In that downward spiral, there's no end to that. That just everything kind of goes to zero until deficit ceilings passed. And you could easily lose 25 or 30% of GDP in a couple of weeks. And I, I didn't want to buy anything or do anything, pay off any loans or anything. I wanted to just stay as liquid as I could into this debt ceiling thing. So I kind of crawled up into a hole personally. And I, no other people who did the same thing. Just trying to develop a sort of, you know, mental model of what's going on when the stock market goes up. One of our patrons, Priya Darshan Singh, asks, when the stock market goes up, for those holding equity securities, their wealth goes up as if out of thin air. What is the corresponding liability for the additional wealth thus created? It's a corporate liability. So the corporation has a stack of liabilities and the equities on the bottom of the liability stack. They call it the credit stack. So the first liabilities might be to pay taxes, you know, and then after that, they've got, let's say, senior bondholders and then junior bondholders and then unsecured debt. And then after that, if there's anything left over, the equity holders get it. And that's a corporate obligation. So if there wasn't any equity, then, or if there's only one share or something, then uh, that shareholder would get all of that. And so it, the market values that equity. The market values that corporate liability to pay out its profits, net profits. Could we look at it from the other way around and say that the liability went up before the market value of the stock itself went up to reflect that? I think it's the same thing. The market value is the liability. It's like the val liability. What's a Bitcoin? Where does the market value come from? You know, or anything else. Your house goes up 30%. Where does that come from? You haven't sold it. It's where somebody's willing to buy it, right? But it's not a guaranteed liability, is it, in this case? Well, yeah, stocks are just where somebody's willing to buy it on that day, at that point in time, for a certain number of shares. But also the company could turn out not to be as profitable as believed. Sure, or more profitable. What's happening is the market has undervalued these companies because it was assuming some kind of earnings recession and negative earnings, and it just never happened. We did have a little bit of a setback in earnings because there was a setback for COVID, and then after COVID, it was a big burst of so profits for right? And then they come down a little bit, but now they're going back up again as the economy normalized. It's kind of a you know, reaction to COVID down and up and leveling off. There was volatility, yeah. 
Just to put a button on this interest income channel question, you know, so the people are arguing that people who hold government bonds and they're getting those coupon payments from the government, they're already very rich. And people that rich have a lower propensity to consume the less wealthy people. And this is what you've just talked about at the beginning. Yeah, they probably do. I'm not going to argue with them. But if you notice, Rolls Royce has sold out for like four years. Right. $400,000 okay. a car. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah. So, basically, I'll, I'll say your position back to you, and you say whether I've understood it correctly. It's just, well, that, the, you know, that GDP growth is coming from somewhere. And the, until somebody could come up with an alternative explanation, this is where I, I'm saying it's coming from. 200-meter super yachts, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cut down half the rainforest for the teak decks. And look at all the employment you get and all the junk. All that money trickles down to somebody. This is the biggest case of trickle-down economics in history. And I'm not saying a lot trickles down or that it's any policy I'd ever recommend. It's the most obscenely regressive stimulus policy ever. The, the amount of the interest being paid by the U.S. government is exceeding what we paid out in stimulus checks. And they are stimulus checks, but only to people who have money in proportion to how much they have. What kind of an obscenely regressive policy is that? But that's what's going on. And the argument is, oh, it's okay to be regressive like that because those people don't spend the money. It's like, okay. <laughs> well, that sets me up nicely for another patron question, which is Eugenio Triana is asking, now that the rate hikes have stopped and the rate of price rises, I mean, I'm not sure that they've stopped. It's just they had a pause this time, haven't they? That's just me editorializing there. Well, they skipped a meeting, but they said there's going to be two more coming. They've announced there are two more. Okay, fair enough. So there's your expectations being set there, right? So what he's asking is, you know, now that the rate of price rises in the US is decelerated, do you expect the Fed to stay put, resume their rises, begin to cut rates? Well, we've already answered that, I guess, because they've told us what they're planning to do at this point. But what will the effect on GDP be if it begins to cut rates or when it eventually begins to cut rates? Is there a danger of a contraction in that case or should fiscal spending counteract that? Because, you know, what you said is the rate hikes have been stimulatory. And finally, he's got one more thing to add in here. Do you expect to see any impact to the larger US economy from the resumption in student debt that is looking likely to happen in October. And I suppose he means student debt repayments. So in reverse order, I've heard that's like the payments will be like five billion a month. So that's sixty billion a year, which is two tenths of a percent of GDP. You know, so it's something, but it's not catastrophic. And it's the question is will that affect those people's spending? How many of those people are, you know have the money, have been anyway and have done well and have equity and is it going to affect their lifestyle? I don't know. But the data will tell us. So there'll be some in that cohort of people who start repaying debts who can't afford it. So they are going to cut back on lifestyle or take out other loans to pay the previous loans. Yeah, or get the money from their parents. That's pretty common because the parents sort of feel they're supposed to pay for the kids' education anyway. So they help them with the student loans. And then there will be people who can, quote, unquote, afford the repayments, and then that will come out of their income and they'll have less disposable income. I, I guess there's, there'll be definitely be those two cohorts. But I guess this goes to your idea of like unemployment being an unspent income story, because there's an industry behind all of that, right? There's the finance industry. That's income to them, those debt repayments. Well, you know, the, part of it, the interest is. Yeah. And so... Whether that results in unemployment or not is, well, okay, what do those businesses that get that income now do with that income? Yeah, but I don't think two-tenths of a percent of GDP increase in, you know, spe- in it's like a tax, let's say. It's, it's just not enough to move the needle. Right, okay. It might go up a tenth of a percent or something. I don't, I don't think it's enough to do much. We're already at 8%. So let's say the deficit goes to 78 So what? Uh, still big. So the other question that Eugenio asked was, is there a danger of a contraction or should fiscal spending counteract that? I don't see much danger of contraction when you've got an 8% federal deficit because the government itself is directly 25% of the economy and directly maybe 50% through all the medical payments. And, and I just saw Medicare payments just went way up. But anyway, and so you've got half the economy getting that 8%, it's kind of like 16%, you know, of the half, right? It's like 50% of the economy is getting 8% of GDP. So it's, it's a big number. And it's hard to like imagine any kind of a slowdown with that kind of spending. Now, the exception would be 
if prices went up faster than the deficit spending. And I don't see that happening now. I don't see prices going up at 8%. I, the core PCE that the Fed watches is about 4 It's been going sideways now, which is what they talked about. Their forecast has been for it to go lower, and it's still to go lower. I'm sorry, it's about 45 maybe 5 And they're projecting now 39 by the end of the year. But like Chairman Powell said, he's been wrong about this, and they're watching it. That's why they need to have at least two more rate hikes to bring this down. But of course, my narrative is it's supporting it. The reason it's been sticky at high levels longer term, not month to month or even three months to three months, is because the interest rate of 5% acts to support a price level growing at about 5%. And so that's what he's up against now. And he doesn't understand that. And an 8% deficit is keeping demand high enough to keep it so that unemployment is going to stay low. Well, you're not going to have any lack of demand causing prices to come down. Everything's going to have to be on the supply side. So I, I don't see that coming down. And, and the more they raise rates, of course, the higher it'll go. And so I think they're going to get a little worried when it doesn't come down. They're already worried. And the hikes might exceed 25 basis points. If he channels his Paul Volcker uh, personality, which he's talked about, he doesn't want to be the next Arthur Miller who was disgraced for not raising rates when he should have, which would have been right now. And he wants to be Volcker. He's going to talk about 2% at a time, go from five and a quarter to seven and a quarter to be able to like stop. You know, if this thing starts running away from this level, if they were sort of wrong about this pause with an announcement, as, then yeah, I think it wouldn't surprise me for them to start going higher to try and get ahead of the curve. It's the way they say it. With housing's coming back, you know, we see mortgage applications starting to go up. It's only a week or so, but they, you know, they should have kept going down. We see housing prices start going up. We see sales starting to go up. Looks like they bottomed the end of November. That was the one area of weakness and now that's turning up. It's not going to be subtracting from GDP anymore. And with the debt ceiling behind us, you know, the next quarter's GDP could be higher than the one and a half to two and a half where this quarter's coming in right now. And that's just going to, they're, they're going to be at a loss to what to do. And the only thing they can do is raise rates high enough to break it down. That's, that's all they know. At some point, you will cause a recession though. Why? Oh, look, look at Argentina. You know, when we were there, I was here with Elizabeth a year ago, met with the central bank rates were like 25. Because inflation was 20 or rates were 30 because inflation was 25 or something like that. I met with the head of the central bank there and a couple of other people in a private meeting. And he said, well, you don't have to introduce yourself. I've been following you for 10 years. <laughs> so that was nice. And then he had his analyst with him who agreed with me on the interest rate thing saying, yes, Sergeant Wallace or some mainstream guys did this in 1987 and showed the same thing that if debt to GDP gets high enough. And so in Argentina, it was the same thing. If you, you keep raising rates, you're just pushing up your inflation rate. And they said, we have to do that. We have an agreement with the IMF and whatnot. They kept doing it. So inflation went to like 30, so rates went to 35. And inflation goes to 40, so rates go to 45. Inflation goes to 50, rates go to 55. And just a few weeks ago, rates went to 97 because inflation was up to 90 or 100 or something. And no recession, <laughs> okay? No financial crisis, no banking crisis. Unemployment's way down. The economy is strong. You're just throwing all these pesos at it. And yeah, most of them wind up getting sold in the foreign exchange markets for because nobody wants them. It drives the currency down, drives inflation up, and they're in this inflationary spiral. And they keep raising rates and feeding pesos into the foreign exchange markets, creating their own inflation. So it's the same thing. Is there not a chance that the interest rates at some point cause some sort of financial instability? Well, it did happen in Argentina. They're at 100%. Now, would it in 1979 under Volcker? Yeah, we had a different, you know, institutional structure. For the last, I'd say since the SNL crisis in the 80s, the bank regulators are intensely focused on interest rate sensitivity. I had a small bank for 20 years. Those guys would come in and they'd do everything they could to make, sh you know, they had requirements where you had to produce reports showing that if interest rates went up, you weren't going to lose money. Your assets were matched to liabilities. If you had a five-year loan at 5%, you better have a five-year deposit or something at 3% so that you were going to make money for that loan. So if deposit rates went up, you know, you were already locked in or you had floating rates on your loans. So that if deposit rates went up, your loan rates would go up. And they had you test for two, three, four, 500 basis points, whatever increases to make sure that your earnings didn't go down if rates went up. And if they did, they were all over you. They could shut you down. They could, they'd fire management. They'd do whatever they want. They were not nice people. Do you think that you felt it more because it was a small bank? No, I think the large banks just got hammered on this. So I, I can imagine what a JP Morgan or somebody went through because that's where they see their systemic risk. 
you know, if my $20 million banks fail, they, they don't care. But it was a, a trillion dollar bank. Yeah. They don't want to do that. So they are all over those guys, you know, against the, you know, to ensure they don't have that kind of systemic risk and that they're doing their models correctly to make sure rate increases don't damage them. in their lending policies. The rates they're charging, their terms of the loans, it's all based on that. Could it not be argued, though, that for a too big to fail bank, well, for a small enough to fail bank, like perhaps yours was, Warren, they're all over you because they're like, okay, give us a reason to shut you down. And for JP Morgan, they're all over them going, okay, you're too big to fail. So, you know, tell us what you need for us to shore you up. Well, no, well, too big to fail means that they're going to have to pay for the losses, right? So they want to make sure there aren't any losses. And they come in and they see you're making 10-year loans and you're borrowing the money overnight. They say, no, could rates go up? You're going to lose money on that loan. Or we're going to have to pay for it. So we're not going to do that. Now, what's interesting about that, which ties back to SVB Bank, is these banks had all these uninsured deposits, right? So SVB Bank with $300 billion might have had, I don't know, I'll just make something up, $100 billion of insured deposits and $200 billion of uninsured. And so when there was a problem, the uninsured guys wanted out because they got scared. So why would the regulators allow that many uninsured deposits that could cause a liquidity crisis. It's because the regulators were worried about losing money in terms of an economic bank's failure. And in a bank's failure like that, where they don't have, let's say SVB had 300 million of assets, let's say they lost $150 million somehow. You know, and if they were all insured deposits, then the regulators would have to be on a hook for $150 billion. But if there's $200 billion of uninsured deposits, well, they would take the loss first. And then after that, the insured deposits would be okay. So it wouldn't cost the FDIC any money. So they looked at uninsured deposits as a buffer, like equity capital almost, against the deposits that the FDIC was insuring, right? So they liked it. They liked having a lot of uninsured deposits because that meant they weren't going to have any losses on their insured deposits, which they didn't. So SVB failed, whatever, but th there was no losses on the insured deposits. There were some losses on the uninsured that they decided to pay. But when they were regulating them, you know, the week before, the year before, that wasn't part of their equation. They were just concerned about whether they would have to pay out money on their deposit insurance. And so that near-term bias towards, you know, specific policy gave them an incentive to create systemic risk because the uninsured deposits were not a risk to that one bank's FDIC, you know, bailout money. They were a risk to the whole banking system because then the, it would all shut down because everybody would, you know, all the banks had uninsured deposits and they'd all flee or go to JP Morgan or something and then they'd all go under. And so the FDIC inadvertently created this huge systemic risk, which they dealt with. But, you know, when what they were trying to do was eliminate individual bank risk, which they did. So they eliminated individual bank risk to insure deposits, but at the same time, they created this systemic risk. So the whole thing in that sense, was a failure of regulation. They were looking at the micro and not the macro. And it's kind of an honest mistake, I guess. There's nobody there who thinks like that. And they've addressed it. So it's a thing of the past, I think, which is what happens. Look, bank regulation evolves. As you have problems, they do things to avoid the problem the next time. And I don't think most analysts appreciate the extent to what's that's happening. They say, oh, we know how banks are. They're, they, You can say whatever you want. They're going to borrow short and lead long. And if they were on the front lines at a bank dealing with regulators, they would know they don't do that anymore. Yeah, they used to. They used to do it a lot, you know, but they don't do that anymore. So they're kind of fighting last year's war when they're worried about bank solvency right now and how interest rates are going to create a financial crisis. I think, I think that's last year's battle. And I don't think the institutional structure now is vulnerable to that kind of risk right now. They are vulnerable to unemployment going up to you know, 10%, people not being able to make their payments, and then all their assets go bad, and then the whole thing caves in. That systemic risk is there. You can't get around that. But not these other things that happen during good times just because the Fed raised rates. Okay. That kind of sets me up for something that another patron, Vincent Gomez, was asking. He writes, it would be really helpful if Warren could explain how the banking system is just a residual holder of government securities. They can either hold the reserves created in the process of government spending or swap them for bonds, which they often will. So why do we have such volatility in bond markets? What is the point? Right. So the volatility in bond markets comes from the Fed sets the overnight rate. And then the Treasury sells longer-term securities. So how do you know what rate 
is that they're going to clear at. Well, it depends on what you think is going to happen to the overnight rate. If the overnight rate right now is five and a quarter, and you think it's going to go to 10, then you know, if the market in general thinks it's going to go to 10, then the longer term rates are going to trade up so that the, you know, the yield you receive is equivalent to just keeping your money in overnight funds for the next, let's say it's a 10 year yield for 10 years. So if I put my money in the bank at right now at five and a quarter, and their bank's now paying the policy rate, and you put your money in a 10 year treasury note, whatever the market yield is, that yield expresses indifference levels. It says that my return over the next 10 years, staying in overnight money, getting the policy rate, is going to be identical to your return in the 10-year treasury security. So if the treasury security is at five and a quarter and the overnight rates at five and a quarter, the markets are saying, you know, over time, the Fed rate's going to average five and a quarter. You know, right now, the 10-year treasury rate might be at 4% with the overnight rates at five and a quarter. That's because the markets believe that rates are going to come down from here. If I keep my money overnight at five and a quarter, I'll get that this year. Next year, I'll get four and three quarters, and I'll get four the next year, and the next year, I'll get three and a half. And I'm going to average the same that the person in the 10-year note is getting now, which is 4%. So the markets are expressing indifference levels. You know, And there are some technicals. It might be an exceptionally large auction. It might move things a few basis points. But by and large, it's just expressing indifference levels. So as the news changes, inflation comes in higher. So now the expectation is Fed's going to raise rates. But what does that mean, expectation? Well, you'll see the 10-year bond go up to maybe 5% because the expectation changed from the average over those 10 years is going to be 4 to the average over those 10 years is going to be 5. And so expectations and the 10-year are the same thing. That expresses expectations of where the overnight rate is going to go. And that's how the term structure works when they set the overnight rate and then the market has to figure out what it wants to pay for a longer term, what, how much interest it wants to receive or not, or pay on longer term securities. To summarize that, could I say it simply that the volatility in the bond market comes from a speculation on the future decisions of the central bank? Yeah, it's the volatility of expectations of to what the central bank is going to do next. That keeps changing every time unemployment number comes out, every time the GDP comes out the expectations of what the central bank is going to do change. And so that's reflected in the yields of the longer term securities. Okay. Well, that brings us to this side of the pond because there's a monetary policy committee meeting at the Bank of England next week. The financial press this week reported that our government's borrowing costs at some point rose above the levels that were hit during the Liz Truss mini budget fiasco. But this time the borrowing costs, quote unquote borrowing costs, uh, as I'm going to call them, rose in light of stronger than expected jobs and pay figures. And that's reinforced expectations that the Bank of England will hike rates next week or maybe this week to the people who are listening to this by the time it gets published. But what they mean by government borrowing costs going up is that the yield on government bonds in the secondary market went up, as I understand it. And uh, maybe it's just me. Right. Or where the yields they'd have to pay to sell new ones also. Right. Okay. This is what I'm asking. I, I, I have a problem when gilt yields are described as what it costs the government to borrow. Yeah. It's if they sell new ones, it's what it costs them. Yeah. Right. Right. That's the cost if they sell new ones. Right. Okay. And the market is determining that. Yes. By choice. I mean, that's what the central bank, that's what the treasury, that's what parliament wants. They want the market to determine it. They don't have to issue those bonds at all. They could just issue three-month bills or whatever you call them there. I think it's just called a three-month bond deal. You have three-month securities. They could just do everything in three months and not worry about the bonds at all. Now, under Liz Trust, if the bond yields went up, that was anticipation that there'd be inflation or something would happen that would cause the central bank to raise rates. So, let me check this with you guys, see if I've got this right. Bond traders this week are looking at better than expected jobs and pay figures that came out. And they're thinking the way the VOE are going to react is by raising the base rate by, we guess, 25 basis points. Yes. And the bond traders are reacting to that by selling off gilts, which pushes up the yield on those gilts. And then the newspapers report that as an increase in the cost of borrowing for the government. First of all, does that bit sound right? Well, you know, if they push rates up 25, whatever the government issues to borrow is going to be 25 higher, roughly. But they frame it as if the market has imposed a new cost of borrowing, as opposed to the whole thing being triggered by the government deciding to pay more on, it, on its existing debt. But the government allows 
market forces. It's a matter of policy that they want markets to do that. Markets won't do that unless there's a policy in place for them to do it. And the policy is they issue longer-term securities. If they didn't, if they only issued three-month bonds or whatever you call them, then it would just be at the policy rate, whatever the Bank of England said. It's like going to the bank with some money and saying, I'd like to save some money with you, and then going, well, how much interest would you like us to pay you? <laughs> you know? Well, you know, the banks do compete for your money. So if they say we're paying three and another bank says four, you go to the other bank. Yeah, yeah, but no bank goes, you know, you name it, name your price. I like the government down here. The government down here decided the USVI Senate you know, passed a resolution or something to borrow money from the banks. They didn't say anything about the banks have, you know, have to approve the loan. <laughs> it says, you know, the, the article is written like the government decided to borrow from the banks, not that the banks agreed to lend them anything, which, you know, half the time the banks won't do it, but they still act like it's the other way around. But, you know, no bank would go, you tell us, <laughs> please, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, how much interest income would you like to get from us? You know? <laughs> Well, the thing is, if you tell them four and they've got somebody else showing them money at three and a half, they'll say, thank you very much, but we have a better offer. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. So the Bank of England are also adding gilts into the market by quantitative tightening, right? And the Fed are doing the same thing with treasuries. And another one of our patrons, Paul Danderand, is asking, can anyone explain why the Fed thinks it needs to reduce its balance sheet and what MMT says about this and what's the problem, if any, with the Fed holding treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, or government agency debt? Well, there's no problem. And I specifically have advocated that they hold mortgage-backed securities, but that they actually just fund the lending in the first place. So you don't even have them. Just have it on the Federal Home Loan Bank or Fannie Mae, whoever's doing the lending, just have them lend the money through the banking system like they do now and just keep those loans on their books and let the Fed fund them directly. Don't even have the agencies fund anything in the market and pay 25 basis points for risk perception or something. And the reason is fixed rate mortgages can be paid off at any time. And so they have what's called convexity, which means that if I'm an investor and I invest in a 7% mortgage now, a new mortgage security, it's going to have an average life because people pay every month of maybe seven years, something like that, five to seven years. But if rates go higher, that average life could go out to 10 or 12 years or more because people are going to, with the low rates, are not going to refinance it. They're going to be less likely to move. Just like people now with three and a half percent mortgages or those mortgages went from a seven year average life where people would move or pay them off to maybe a 15 year average life because people don't want to do that because it's a good deal. So if I invest in these 7% mortgages and rates go higher, instead of having a seven-year security, I might wind up with a 15-year security. At the same time, if rates go lower, everybody will refinance and pay mine off, and I'll wind up with a two-year security instead of a seven-year. So if rates come down, it's shortened. If rates go up, it gets longer. It's like it works against me in both directions. So to make that's called vol, you know, volatility. Of, you know, as interest rates are volatile, as the Fed moves them up and down, the amount of volatility of rates you know, negatively affects me. And that's called negative convexity in these mortgages. 
you don't know if they're going to get longer or shorter, but you know it's going to be the wrong one. They're going to get longer if rates go higher and shorter if rates go lower. So you're going to get hurt either way. And so you don't buy them unless you get some extra yield to make up for that. So treasuries, 10 years might be 4%. You might be able to get 65 on a mortgage if you're an investor. Okay, that's a good deal. I'm getting 65 instead of 4 But you know, at least if I get the 4 and rates come down, I get to keep it for the whole 10 years. And if rates go up, it's still going to be a 10-year. It's not going to get stuck with it for an extra five years. So th- there's a price on that. Okay, and if you're a large portfolio, you have to hedge that. So if you've got billions and billions, even a small portfolio, but if you own these things and interest rates start to change, suddenly you've got much longer securities than you wanted. You got to, to have the same risk, you've got to sell some. So when rates go higher and prices start going down, you have to sell some and take a loss. And the other thing happens if prices start going higher, you've got to buy some and pay more expensive prices. So as the markets go up and down, you're always buying and selling at the wrong time hoping you don't waste enough money to eat up your entire 2.5% advantage you got because you got a 65 instead of 4, right? And that's called dynamic hedging. And it's the same as option traders have to do the same thing. There's optionality in these things. They're positively convex. They have options. And so that creates a lot of volatility when you have mortgage-backed securities in the financial markets because rates start going higher. They're all, everybody with portfolios has to sell some and make it exacerbates the move. The same thing when rates go lower, they have to buy some. And so you get a lot more volatility and disruption when rates change. Now, if the Fed owns them or funds them, it doesn't care. <laughs> it just doesn't care. The way I say it is it eats the volatility. If their loan turns out to be longer because rates went higher, it's like they don't care and they don't do anything. So what they do when they buy mortgage-backed securities or when they fund mortgages directly is they take volatility out of the market, which I think serves public purpose, which is why I've proposed that all mortgages be funded by the central bank and not by the private sector. So we don't have all this crazy volatility every time rates change. Just what you wanted to hear, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now explain that in a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of mortgages being provided by the public sector as opposed to private banking. Which they sort of already are. Okay. But I remember you saying a while back, and maybe this doesn't conflict, but just to clarify, that the private sector was better at assessing risk than the public sector. And that was one of the reasons why you didn't think the activities of the commercial banking sector should go on the public sector. Or maybe I misinterpreted you. So what I said is that would be a reason to have the commercial banks make the decision as to whether they lose money in the case of a default. All right. But once we have insured mortgages, they're all Fannie Mae insured now anyway. You know, they're all Ginny May insured mortgages. So the private sector doesn't take the loss on those. The government's already setting the terms. And it's kind of like a buffer stock housing policy, right? It's, it's geared towards low income people. And they feel the social benefit of getting more people into houses is worth the risk of having the occasional loss, you know, from a social level. And so we've done this for a very long time. And we've had generations of Americans grow up in low government finance homes. So the, the Fannie Mae or Ginnie Mae mortgage rate might be 6%, where the private sector mortgage rate might have been 75 and a lot of people couldn't have afforded it. So it, it brings it, the affordability down to a group of people that wouldn't have been there before who raised their children in homes instead of in cities or whatever. And there's been a decision made that that serves public purpose. Now, if you don't think it does, if you think raising kids in private homes is bad, then you wouldn't do that. You know, so it's part of social policy, and it's been a part of U.S. social policy for at least 50, 70 years now, I think, maybe more, to do that, to provide lower interest rate mortgages to lower income people. And it it hasn't lost money for a long time. The only time it lost money, I think, was in 2008 on a mark-to-market. It didn't actually lose money on a cash flow basis. You know, it's just the market value went down temporarily. Like, who cares? So, of course, you know, the right wing deemed that a total failure of 50 years of policy. The fact that two generations grew up in homes and became good citizens and went to college means nothing. (laughs) Fannie Mae had a mark to market (laughs) loss of $12 billion. So, we never should have done that. (laughs) But whatever. You know, it's political. They like to focus on the things that they care about. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so we're back doing it. And they may still think it's a bad idea. I don't know. But that, but it's a political decision. You know, what happens, what it is, and then politically you have to decide if that's what you want. So while we're talking about all these shenanigans, is it fair to say our view is Japan, central banking-wise, has it about as right as you can get it in this current 
environment and have for a while with their zero interest rate policy and their yield curve control. Is that fair to say? Yeah. At the same time, you know, you don't have like a lot of Syrian immigrants looking to go to Japan. But I mean, whatever problems they might have, you know, let's say that they did have refugees needing to get into Japan, you know, and it created maybe a border crisis or something like that. It's still not going to be solved by, you know, hey, well, let's just, uh, do, you know, 25 basis point hike, <laughs> right? True. But it's also, you know, I don't know how much of it is an understanding of how rates work. I think their core inflation is still only like two and a half percent and coming down quickly. And for 30 years, been unable to keep it at 2%. It was always below target. And so they're keeping rates low to make sure that core is at least at their target before they consider a rate hike. And so they still sort of have the narrative backwards as far as the headlines go. Now, behind the scenes, Bill Mitchell's been there talking to him. I got some Japanese people I talked to, not in the central banks, but, you know, peripherally, they're associated with them. And they seem to understand what we're talking about, how the zero rates, the high rates are inflationary. But that's not their official narrative. Their official narrative is still 100% conventional that They've got a deflation problem still, and they've got to have low rates to make sure they don't settle back into deflation. And that's their political risk. They're still trying to stimulate the economy in a monetarist way. Right. And, and of course, we've been telling them for 30 years that the zero rate doesn't stimulate the economy. And they keep raising the consumption tax because they're afraid of the deficit spending. You know, So they've still got the narrative backwards, at least officially. Now, maybe the central bankers all have it correct. I don't know who they are. I think Bill seems to think they do have it correct behind the scenes, you know, but I, I don't have firsthand information. It's nice to see like one government in the world telling the bond market <laughs> what's going to happen rather than the other way around. Well, you know, it used to be Greece for the euro. They would set their long term drachma rates 12%, 11% in the market. That's what you got. <laughs> so. Nobody remembers that, I guess. But. but in places like the US and the UK, where we don't have a taste for ZERP and yield curve control, what do you think about the idea of a central bank just being given a higher inflation target? Well, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of yield curve control? I don't know. How about just stop issuing those long-term securities? So I asked Chairman Bernanke that question when I had a meeting. With, there was only four of us at the meeting when he was chief economic advisor at the White House. He'd just been vice chair of the Fed for four years, took a year at the White House, then became chair of the Fed. And, you know, I said, one of the questions I asked, we're just here to kind of ask innocent questions. And they had just talked about unconventional monetary policy. He'd written a paper with Vince Reinhardt and that group, who actually helped me write some of my speeches, my MMT speeches. So, so the staff guys knew, knew exactly what I was talking about. But I said, look, given the fact that, you know, the Fed's talking about buying treasury securities as part of your unconventional monetary policy, you know, given the fact that the treasury selling securities in the market and then the Fed buying them, is functionally equivalent to the Treasury not selling them to begin with, maybe just issuing a three-month bill or something. I said, given that, has there been any discussion of the Fed coordinating with the Treasury so the Treasury doesn't have to sell them and the Fed buy them, just have the Treasury not issue them? He says, well, no, there is a difference. When we buy them at the Fed, it adds reserves. So clearly, he, when the Treasury sells them, it subtracts reserves. He, he, didn't understand, he clearly did not have him any kind of minimal understanding of monetary operations. He was all like ivory tower theory, even though he'd been vice chair of the Fed for four years. And to that point, he made a statement later and said, well, you know, when investment picks up, it'll use up the available funds and drive up interest rates. All right. So he'd just been vice chair of the Fed. Every meeting, they have to vote. Do you want rates to go up, down, or be unchanged? There was no market changing the rates, right? They were doing it with a raising their hand to vote. So he knew. <laughs> yeah, he still had the idea in his head that if investment picked up, it would raise rates. <laughs> and so he was just totally divorced from the operations level of the Federal Reserve. He just had no idea how it worked, which came out you know, during the crisis because he couldn't even add liquidity for like, properly for six months. And they did all kinds of TARP and other things else, which were totally mislabeled and misunderstood and didn't function the way they thought and didn't understand markets or anything. But you know, but it all came from this academic model that he had at Princeton or wherever he was teaching, you know, and which was based on fixed exchange rate policy, obviously. But he didn't understand that distinction. He was a very nice guy. There's no conspiracy theory. He was trying to do the right thing. I mean, he was you know, a very upstanding person, personally. But it just wasn't in his skill set. They just didn't have it. No, I think I'd bring up the higher inflation target because I'm thinking that would change the game completely then because then the markets 
would be looking at positive job figures like the rest of us would be looking at them like, oh, that's good. Oh, so if you raise the Fed's inflation target to 10% or something? <laughs> yeah, just as a workaround, right? They're emphatic that 2% is where it has to be or else. And Chairman Powell was emphatic about that in the last speech that it needs to come down there to help long-term growth and employment and everything else. Otherwise, your whole economy is messed up. Yeah, yeah. So you have to kill the economy to grow it, right? What do they base this 2% on again? Price stability, you know, for investment and for planning and all kinds of stuff. But like, how is it derived? Why 2%? Why not 3%? Well, they, th they like zero, <laughs> oh, but okay. they think 2% gives you enough to have, it gives you some kind of an incentive because your savings and your nominal savings is, is being wheeled away. It's kind of like a tax, right? And so it gives people incentives to work and, and try harder. I think that's my understanding. But again, that's just vibes, right? But it's not a deficit target. It's an inflation target. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's just vibes. Like, yeah, 2% is going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is. No science there. So this is what I'm saying. All right. Seeing as you guys are just bothered about a number, let's just change that number. <laughs> and then when wages grow and jobs figures get better, you know, we're thinking, oh, great. You know, more people are in work and they're getting paid more. The bond markets are going, oh, that's terrible news. Or no, sorry. The bond markets are, that's terrible news because the central bank's going to raise rates. Whereas, you know, if the target was higher, they'd be like, oh, maybe the central bank won't raise rates. We don't have to create all this instability of the bond market and, you know, happy days. Right. But of course, raising rates is great for corporate America and earnings and banks and everything else. <laughs> yeah, at the macro level, raising rates is like boom time, right? Yeah, yeah. The other thing is, as they raise rates, if there's an effect that slows down housing, let's say, it kind of already happened. Okay, so housing dropped 50% or something. It's not going to drop to zero just because rates go up. You know, it reaches a core where people have to buy, they pay cash, whatever. And so there's like a diminishing effect on housing as you raise rates higher and higher. The initial rates have a larger effect. After a while, the effect slows down, right? But the effect on paying interest out is not. It, it keeps going up. <laughs> you're just pounding out more interest, and so the debt gets larger, and the debt to GDP goes up, and you're pounding out more, and it accelerates up. So it's kind of asymmetrical. So you know, in Argentina, the debt to GDP is only 30%, but with 100% rates, that means interest is 30% of GDP. It's crazy. You know, so as you go higher, their interest payments become a higher, higher percent of GDP. And they do less and less damage to the interest sensitive sector because they're already down to whatever they're going to be. With South American countries, it's often said, and, and developing countries in general, it's often said that they don't have a choice and they have to raise rates whenever America raises rates or else they lose out. How much truth is there in that? And what's the alternative to raising rates? Well, as you know, MMT doesn't apply to South America. <laughs> <laughs> all this time you said it now it's on the record yeah. so i just did a with that argentina thing i did a presentation i don't know if you've seen it that file on twitter a couple of times and i've had lots of proposals over time but look any country can sustain full employment if you've got to sell off some of your real wealth to pay external debt because politically you think it's a good idea and don't want to not pay you've got to do that whether you're at full employment or not if you're at full employment, your domestic output is going to be higher. You're going to have more chits to pay your debt with. <laughs> and so you're going to be better off. Your real wealth is your domestic output plus imports minus exports, right? And when I say that, they say, oh, so exports are bad. I said, I didn't say, I didn't say exports are bad. You know, like, the straw manning is crazy, even with MMT proponents. And then they'll agree that exports being an economic cost means they're bad. Thing. It's not a morality thing here. You know, they are what they are. Well, anyway, so the thing is, you can use your domestic current. You can go to a zero-rate policy and stay there. You can use your domestic and stop paying all that interest and stop feeding it into the foreign exchange markets. And deal with your problems some other way instead of making it worse. Not that it's going to cure everything, but it takes away, you know, one of your problems, one leg of your problems. You know, and then deal with what's left. And so Turkey's kind of interesting. They keep raising the minimum wage by big numbers, like 50%, you know, another 50%. And so they're kind of keeping the people in that category, which are lower income because it's minimum wage, right? Whole with inflation. So you always have winners and losers. Well, they're now all of a sudden all the working population is, they're not losing. Okay. Now fixed income people may be losing. Higher income people have to scramble to try and keep up with inflation, but it's a pretty good size constituency is, is keeping up. And so Erdogan wins the election because they vote for him. 
And so he's got the working class people behind him because that's his special interest group that he keeps even with inflation by giving them raises and bringing in businesses. And even with all the external debt and everything else, that group in real terms is keeping up to a high enough extent where he keeps getting reelected, assuming the elections are honest, which of course, I don't have any idea. And it's a very progressive policy in that sense, not universally progressive, but progressive from the sense that the real output, number one, goes to the people doing the real work. That's not like the least progressive thing in the world or anything. It's, it's, not, it's not bad. And not that I support the society. Nobody's trying to, you know, Syrian refugees trying to go to Turkey either. What, what you're saying is you're not, you're saying, that you, you know, you don't support the regime's policy. Right, right. It's not my first choice for public policy. But, but if the working classes are keeping up, then why does inflation matter? <laughs> you're right. It doesn't matter to them. Now, maybe their grandmother's on fixed income and it's hurting her, but so people can work and get jobs and you know, unemployment is low and they're getting a fair wage in their estimation, then this is good, you know? And 100% inflation is like 8% a month. So it's not like you got to run to the grocery store. It's 2% a week or something. It's only 2%, right? So if you get paid enough lira for groceries and if you wait a week, you lose 2%. It's not like you lose it all. And they vote for the guy, right? It's politically successful. And that's, that's all I'm saying right now. Just before we move on, because we had a question from one of our patrons, John Ibbotson, about Turkey, and we're just here right now. And he was writing, after holding down interest rates for a long time, because like you, Warren, they believed high rates actually contribute to inflation, they've given up and they plan to double them next week. I, I know. They got some new central banker in. Right. Totally neoliberal type fairly young person. Right. And well, first of all, is that the previous central banker, is that correct to say that they actually believed, you know, the same as you? It wasn't easy for him to find a central banker to actually do it. Right. He had to fire a couple of them and they found some guy who agreed to do it. So they were at one with this idea that high rates are contributing to inflation. No, it was just Erdogan. Okay. So it wasn't even the central banker. No, no, they did it reluctantly, but I don't think they liked it. And look, he may have been getting pushback from people, you know, higher income groups who wanted their savings to keep up with inflation. Because, look, they were giving index deposits out to those people, which is a high rate policy, but it just didn't show up in the overnight policy rate. But they had all kinds of index stuff going on that I'd read about casually. I mean, I, I mean, study Turkey. But it's all about politically who they're trying to help and to stay in power. And so John's asking, the currency devaluation and inflation has been massive so far. It's going to get worse. What's the MMT analysis? I guess we've been through that now, but, but what's the cure for Turkey? So it's an internal distributional issue in real terms. They've got good growth in real terms. They've got you know high levels of employment in real terms. And the real wealth of Turkey is like, for them, doing okay, doing well. And just because the numeraire keeps changing, it works politically for Erdogan to let the numeraire change and then just keep indexing his constituency. And so it's a rational policy from that point of view. They're not serious about fighting inflation or anything. They're serious about getting reelected. Right. So, you know, as long as the cohort that he's prioritizing keeps up, it's all good. Yeah, it's a problem for some analysts, you know, because it goes against what he learned in school or something. But for the well-being of the country, it's not a problem. And there are no studies that show high rates of inflation are a real economic problem. They all show that they're not. And that you can get high and often, more often get high levels of growth with high levels of inflation. And just to be correct, I said, and John said currency devaluation, I guess he's talking about depreciation against. You know, the lira went from 20 to 23. It's like, what do they care? They don't even care. Does that bring us to the Beyonce article <laughs> about Be- <laughs> Beyonce causing inflation? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, should, yeah. Shall we dive into that? <laughs> yeah, because that's effectively it. She's causing more spending, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So she had a concert in Sweden. More than 4,000 people flocked to Stockholm to watch her concert. Michael Grahn, the chief economist of Danske Bank in Sweden, estimated the Beyonce effect, that's what he's calling it, added at least 0.2 percentage points to the head line rate. So my questions are, do we think beyond inflation is transitory or secular? <laughs> Should we create a strategic Beyonce reserve to cool off the beyond inflation? I'd say it's a one-time increase and not inflation. <laughs> it's transitory. I think it's transitory. They could have fixed it on the supply side as well, right? If they had, I don't know, prepared a bit better for this increase in demand. Well, if they had booked the rooms in advance, maybe. But it's just a market allocating by price on it. 
it's, it's inflation is a general increase in the price level, not not a relative value story. This, that was just a relative value story. Now, the fact that it got into the index means wages could have been indexed, and you could change a relative value story into a you know inflation story, price level story. But that's public policy. So, one last question from one of our patrons, just to go out on. This is from Nick Sava. He writes, "Hi, Warren." I'm interested in the idea that public sector debts can be thought of as private sector assets. On the rare occasions when the government has been in surplus, such as during the Clinton administration, how did people in the private sector have any money? Okay, so by money, you mean like bank deposits, right? I had imagined, yeah. I know you hate imprecise language, but yeah. I know, I don't know. You know money could be, you know, line. Paul Davis has said, if you have an open line on your credit card, that counts as money. So I, I don't know. But- in the private sector, loans create deposits. Banks buy loans from the borrower, and they pay for them by crediting their account. And those are balances that the depositor has and then uses to buy other things. So what you have are private sector and public sector deficit spending. And unemployment is the evidence that the total deficit spending is insufficient to cover the need to pay taxes and desires to net save in that currency. Because unemployment was low, say 3.5% or something, let's assume there was no unemployment. That would tell you that people preferred to reduce their savings rather than add to it, which is what they were doing because private sector debt was running at 7% of GDP. The deficit was zero or 3% surplus or something. And those were the indifference levels. People were happy to do that. Now, why were they happy to do that? Because they were Number one, it doesn't mean it's sustainable, but that's what was happening at that time. Now, at the time, I was saying this is not a sustainable process to use Win Godley's law rules language. So that's the language we used back then. This is not a sustainable process to have private sector debt growing at 7% while public sector was running a 1% or 2 3% surplus and, you know, and drive growth that way. But we had a couple of things happening. We had a housing boom where people wanted to buy homes and, and take out mortgages. We had Y2K, where there were businesses were spending more than their incomes, deficit spending, to upgrade equipment that they thought was going to fail over Y2K. Then we had this crazy dot-com boom where people were investing into impossible business plans in huge numbers to, to fund all these dot-com companies. And people were willing to, you know, they were voluntarily reducing their savings to do this. They were borrowing, you know, savings is money you have minus what you owe. And it was private sector debt was driving it. So we had a strong, strong private sector debt growth. And so the private sector was doing the deficit spending that funded the growth, the sales, the GDP. And I guess maybe at a more basic level, Nick might be asking, well, given that the government was taxing more than it was spending because it was running a surplus, didn't that hoover up all the money? Sorry to use that loose term. <laughs> didn't that hoover up all the money in the private sector? And I, I guess the answer is, well, obviously no, you know, but like you're saying, it, it wasn't sustainable. Yeah. So you would have somebody selling their house, let's say somebody buying their house, maybe a retired person is selling their house and a person who just got a dot-com job is buying it. They'd sell it for, back then, maybe $250,000 was a lot of money. So they'd go to the bank and get a mortgage for $250,000. The bank would then buy that mortgage note and, and put it in a deposit for the borrower who would then use it to buy the house and would pay the seller. So at the end of the day where there was there were no balances, there was a loan for $250,000, you know, the bank had a loan on its books for two hundred fifty thousand. There was a deposit of new money that wasn't there before for two hundred fifty thousand to the person who bought the house, sold the house, and the person who bought the house reduced their savings by two hundred fifty thousand dollars with that mortgage. They now owed two hundred fifty thousand that they didn't owe before, so that reduced their savings. So here we had a big reduction of savings, okay, in the economy because if this is the only transaction, two hundred fifty thousand, which went to the person who sold the house which then paid $50,000 in capital gains taxes to the government. All right, so now if you look at the private sector as a whole, there was a $250,000 mortgage for the young couple, a $200,000 deposit for the older couple, and they were net negative as a sector, Okay, which, again, it's not a sustainable process, but it went on for several years. I mean, as long as credit's holding up and there's enough deficit spending, public and private together, in this case all private, to drive things, 
that lasted for a while and then it all collapsed of course yeah right right we keep hearing news that companies are choosing not to list on the london stock exchange over here and they're going elsewhere the latest example this last week was we soda does it matter to regular people in the uk if a company lists on the london stock exchange or the new york stock exchange you know there are winners and losers and the thing about the financial sector in the uk I don't know what it is now, but it was a major, like uh, an exporter, really. It took in net revenues from offshore. And that, of course, helps keep the currency stable while you're buying imports and running a trade deficit. Now, if the financial sector is not doing that anymore, if it's lost that, then that's going to affect your real terms of trade. And it's kind of a zero marginal cost export industry, except all the brain drain that's in it. So the idea was you would transition those people into doing something else that's useful, but I'm sure there hasn't been much of an effort in that. They probably just left and they're working in different places in the world. And so it's a brain drain out of the company. You're losing your real resources, which are the people that are capable of earning the money or providing services that have you know a surplus value, so to speak. And so I haven't looked at the macro numbers for the UK, but you know, so I'm, I'm just guessing. Many years ago at a conference, you said, my tagline is the financial sector is more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> Do you still feel the same way? <laughs> yeah, just at the macro level, sure. It's probably consuming 25% of the GDP or something like that between finance, insurance, real estate, maybe 30%. And that's real resources, people working in these things that could be out curing cancer or something like that and, or doing software or cold fusion or anything instead of digging holes and filling them in, which is what the financial sector does and being paid you know millions of pounds and dollars for doing it which means the rest of the economies has that much less in real resources in the financial sector. You know, people are getting all the real resources, the largest homes and the food and the super yachts and everything else. And it's just not my idea of how to conduct public policy. <laughs> in the UK, the financial sector is about 10% of GDP. What about insurance? Is that part of it? I'm not sure, actually. But even that 10% sounds quite a lot. And some people may argue, okay, well, but you're exporting some of those services and getting services in exchange. But I would still feel much more comfortable if we had some lower level of finance and then use the rest of our economy for productive things, even if we ended up exporting them. The example I give in the US is when I first went to work in 1973, we had just had 2.6 million housing starts with a population of I don't know, something less than 200 million people. And all we had were some stupid savings banks like I worked at. We made $140 a week. We made loans at 8%, and we took in deposits at 5 and played golf at 4 o'clock every day. And we were maybe, the financial sector was probably less than 5% of GDP. Years later, with the financial sector at 30% of GDP, you know, 1.8 million homes is a unsustainable bubble with a population of 350 million people. <laughs> so... You don't need the financial sector for the real stuff that gets financed. It's just all, like Kane said, it's, it's casino. And it's just, like I just said, people digging holes and filling them in, getting paid huge sums to do it because the institutional structure has put those incentives in place and rewards them. And we just don't need to do that. So what level, you mentioned it was 5% before, is that where you would say that's enough or would you place it even lower than that. So. Well, with technology, we can probably do it with less, right? Because you can mm -hmm. bank from home on your computer. You don't need all these banks all over the place. So, you know, maybe 2% or something. And, and GDP is much larger. So it doesn't have to grow with GDP, maybe grow with population, but not with GDP. Well, I think this is degrowth that everybody can get behind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Warren, before we wrap up the exciting news for us in the UK and Europe, is that you are on tour this summer and I'm told you are participating in an event in London on the 1st of September at an event organized by the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies. Can you tell us anything about that or anything else you've got going on? I think you probably know more about it than I do. I, I know <laughs> we'll be there and I told yeah. them whatever they want to do is fine and they've rented a venue to have it so there'll be room for a lot of people and we'll see who's there and what we're going to talk about. And then the MMT conference in Germany on the 9th, I'll be at that. Elizabeth and I will be there. And I'm looking for people just recreationally to play tennis with, if, if anybody's in that category. <laughs> I'm like a 3-5 player, you know, senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So people should tweet you if they're in Berlin or London. <laughs> yeah, or send me an email or Twitter message. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
that's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking to MMT founder and author of The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, Warren Mosler. We'll link to where you can stay current with Warren and where you can organize a game of tennis with him. And we'll also link to where you can find out about where you can sign up for the Gower Initiative's mailing list for updates about their event that's going to feature Warren in London on the 1st of September and to where you can find out more about the MMT conference in Berlin, which Warren will also be part of and that takes place on the 9th and 10th of september also just a reminder that applications for the mmt summer school in poznan poland close on the 30th of june you won't want to miss that because it will feature l randall ray nathan tankers yan lang and last week's guest professor stephen hale and for our patreon subscribers there's a link to where you can listen to the edited audio highlights of the book launch of the recently published mmt key insights leading thinkers along with many other patron only episodes check out the show notes for all of the above but for now thanks so much for joining us today on the mmt podcast warren mosler Thank you for having me on and looking forward to doing it again. Thanks very much. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes you can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N Pino, and you can email us at MMT podcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope to hear from you. I should have said dead cat beyonds. That would be a better pun. Anyway, I'm a dad. I have to make jokes like this. (laughs) Okay. Uh,